so I always needed money, so I was working out the weekend, and then I was working full time basically to support my car. Welcome to Mixtape the Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham, Professor of Economics at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. In today's podcast, I'm going to be interviewing the 2021 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, Dr. Josh Angrist at MIT. In this interview, we're going to discuss his upbringing, his time at the Princeton Industrial Relations Group in the 1980s, uh, the seminal contributions with his long-term collaborator and fellow Nobel Prize winner, Hito Imbens, as well as the late Alan Kruger substance of that Nobel Prize winning work on instrumental variables and his direction and leadership of the MIT Blueprint Lab, which he helped found. I wanted to thank you for giving me your time to come on here. Um, uh, so so I guess I want to go ahead. Sorry. I just said my pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start at the beginning. Um, uh, where are you from and uh, sort of what are your earliest memories and milestones that you sort of had as a young person? Uh, well, I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and I grew up in Pittsburgh, but um, I wasn't a very inspired student. I was a bad student in mm. high school, and, and uh, I didn't kind of get interested in schoolwork until kind of later in my college career as a High school student, I mostly um, smoked dope and goofed off and worked. I liked working. I wanted to have money. And I was able to get out of high school with a diploma in 11th grade by figuring out what the minimum requirements were for a diploma in Pennsylvania, which at the time were not very demanding. You had to have a certain number of health classes, which was kind of like sex education and a certain number of gym classes and a certain number of English classes. So I took two of each of those in junior year and left high school at the end of my junior year and went to work full time. And um, what did you end up doing? What was that job? Well, I, I, uh, I had lots of jobs. I started working as a, as a busboy when I was 13 which, you know, it's hard to imagine now, but it wasn't so unusual in my, in my generation, among my friends. I, well, we all wanted to have jobs and we all wanted to have spending money. You know, my father, who had grown up the same way, of course, he, he was much poorer than I was, but he, he said, you know, if I wanted to have money, I needed to get a job. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't just ask, you know. So, uh, but also it was fun to work and, you know, kind of enter the world of work and mm. that kind of interest in the world of work stuck with me from being a busboy at the Gaslight Club in, in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, when I left high school, I worked with mentally handicapped people. We used to call them retarded people. I think that's mm. not politically correct anymore. Yeah. And that's because I had done that at summer camps. Mm. Um, so the camp I went to ran special session for the Pennsylvania Association of Retarded Citizens. Mm. And so then I thought, well, I like that work. So I went and I worked in various institutions. Mm. And then uh, I realized I should probably go to college towards the end of uh, a year and some months of work. How many, wait, so what's the gap between graduating and, and spending the time in that kind of work? It's a couple of years? Uh, no, just a, a year, really. Okay. Well, a year and a summer, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I managed to have three different full-time jobs. I got fired from the first and the last. So that was also a maturing experience. Yeah. And um, that's a long story. It's probably not what you want to hear mostly about, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I decided I should go to college and I was able to get into Oberlin College off the wait list. So I was very happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's a great inspiring story for a lot of people. Uh, you know, it's funny, like a lot of people are real bi uh, bimodal, you know, in terms of their performance. Some people, you know, in classes are sort of like either either do really badly because they're so bored or they're the top of their class. Is that was that kind of how you were as a younger person? 
Yeah, I don't think I gave it much thought. I just school didn't interest me. Mm. I had lots of other interests and hobbies. I did photography. I had a dark room in my basement, you know, back when you did your own processing in a chemical dark room. Yeah. You know, pre digital. And um, I was in a theater group. You know, I had lots of interests, but none of them really intersected with school. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was kind of a hands on guy. My favorite class was print shop, where we soak screened and set type. That's, these are skills that are gone from the world. Mm, mm. for the most part, but I enjoyed doing that stuff. And, um, but then I kind of saw that to be working as a mental, you know, the jobs were called orderly or mental retardation aid. You know, there was, there was some career path there, but it wasn't super promising. The wages were low. The work was hard. Right. Right. So, uh, and, um, I decided I should go to college. I was able to get get in. I was lucky to get into Oberlin. Mm -hmm. Then at Oberlin, I discovered economics. I had a very inspiring econ 101 teacher, a man named Bob Perron. Mm -hmm. And uh, he his class was just so much fun. You know, first of all, I liked the material. Yeah. I liked economics. We had sort of economics in my household. My parents were academics. Uh, they weren't, you know, directly in the economics field, but my father was very interested in economics. Was he a professor? He was a professor of mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon. That, that's how we had ended up in Pittsburgh. Oh, I Both see, my I see. parents were, were for a while on the faculty of CMU. They both left, actually. My mother didn't spend that much time on, at CMU, and my father spent a little longer. But they never left Pittsburgh. Mm. Anyway, we would talk about economics at the dinner table, and. So I had some interest in that. And then, uh, you know, taking this great class and also the classroom environment was a lot of fun. Yeah. I kind of tried to mimic that now. It's it was cold calling, you know, calling on people. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of uh, Professor Parade was sort of in your face. You know, he was mm -hmm. very funny, I thought. Not everybody thought so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I teach like that. Was it so. Uh, so. The, it was the material. It wasn't school. It was something about like you had this intellectual curiosity or something that was, was that sort of, your I just thought it was fun. You know, I don't think at the time I had any strong view about what I should do with my life. Mm. I, I wanted, I, I was motivated partly in high school. I had, I owned cars. I needed a car. I felt like I needed a car and owning a car was very expensive, you know, insurance and my car got six miles to the gallon till I got rid of it. <laughs> I got a better one, but you know, so I always needed money. So I was working out the weekend and then I was working full time basically to support my car. Yeah. You yeah. Know, but then I saw there was probably more to life than that. So, you yeah. know, you're, when you're a teenager, you're not very mature. Right. Right. It's true that now there's a different sort of profile among my colleagues and peers. There's, you know, people tend to push their kids into excelling right. in school. My folks didn't do that. And, and I'm grateful to them for that. Even though I come from a very educated family, mm. they kind of let me do whatever I wanted for better or worse. And sometimes it was quite a bit for the worse. Yeah. But, um, and Were I raised my out. Were they stressed out about you? Sort yeah. Of well, my mother, revealed to me later, yes, that she had many sleepless nights. But at the time, I was indifferent or oblivious. And, um, you know, I kind of raised my kids the same way. I didn't take any interest in my kids schooling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is a nice segue. So I have my second question was, there's something different about you. And the, everything you just said uh, confirms this next question. I can't quite <laughs> put my finger on it. Uh, and maybe it's obvious to other people, but I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's these few details. First of all, you said, uh, everything you just said, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, aimless kind of period of your life that sort of transformed into this other thing. Uh, and, uh, so other things are you ride your mountain bike, but you're like extremely aggressive, uh, in how, how you, you play hard, you sort of are this like work hard, play hard person. It looks like. And um, well, yeah. I hope I'm, I'm aging out of that or maturing. Oh yeah, out of that, okay. So. <laughs> uh, and you have this obviously like in this kind of intense sense of humor that you're not really uh, you don't really mind sharing because your book mm -hmm. has it's filled with all this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy references and Kung Fu and 
you know, I heard P Peter Hall told me you used to drive taxis and you served in the military and you're just clearly incredibly creative. Um, uh, you know, you're like just thinking about, I was just kind of thinking through there's papers of yours that I hadn't thought about since graduate school because I don't study sex ratios anymore, but that was my, <laughs> and you have that wonderful, uh, uh, immigration paper on uh, yeah. that immigration shock. A lot of people don't talk about that. Is it? I loved it. I was just so affected by I'm it. I'm glad you like that. That's I'd say that's a relatively obscure paper. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I loved working on that. I bet. I bet. How'd you come up with that idea? Um. Well, I had done that work with with Bill Evans. Uh, you know, on sibling sex composition and uh -huh. as an instrument for families. Oh, side. yeah. Right. Right. And. Bill and I would talk often about other things we might want to do. Like uh -huh. I had long thought of, you know, what, what would be a good instrument for marriage, a good instrumental variable for marriage, because mm -hmm. there's this, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know, there's this huge marriage premium for men, for yeah. women, it's zero or negative, you know, is that a causal effect or selection? So I was always thinking about that. And Bill and I would talk about it. And then I, I don't know, I know I, I also was interested in immigrants and immigration. And of course, like everybody of my generation, we were heavily influenced by Card's work on immigration. Yeah. And Card was also one, you know, he's one of my thesis advisors. So it's thrilling to be a, getting a Nobel with your thesis advisor. I bet, I bet it's fun. Uh, but anyway, I, I, then I, I guess I, you know, when I, when I think about it, some question that I want to answer. Yeah. You know, I sort of say, well, what is the process that, the, you know, it's a causal question. That's my kind of question, the effect of this or that. And I said, well, what's the process that generates the variability in that? And where, where might I find, you know, something that looks like an experiment? So that, that yeah. could be Maimonides rule, you know, the class right. size cutoffs. And it didn't work out. That paper didn't work out to be exactly that marriage treatment effect that I wanted to get. But it does have variation from the endogamy of, you know, immigrants and second yeah. generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People tend to marry within their ethnic right. group. It's not deterministic, but if a lot of, well, suppose we let in, uh, as I hope we will, lots of Ukrainian refugees. Yeah. You know, that'll be an instrument for somebody's marital status. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I, mean, I think. The, these, these well, maybe there won't be enough. It's a big country. So, but yeah. if you think back to the U.S. in the 1910s and 20s, you know, letting in the immigrants, first of all, was many more and the country uh -huh. was smaller. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right, right. It's hard to get at these sex ratio issues because it's usually so correlated with so many other things. My, yeah. my dissertation was on mass incarceration and its impact on uh, gender ratios, but so many other things are related to that. Yeah. You can't really isolate it. Um, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's sort of, I would say it's always the, the big problem with instrumental variables is always the exclusion restriction. You yeah. Know? It's a good experiment for something, but it's hard to say why. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, have, it's yeah, not yeah, usually exactly. just one thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, I was thinking through, I was listening to all this, how, how all this like really out of the box kind of thoughtfulness uh, and creativity. And, you know, I just keep thinking there's something that's really different about you. And uh, I just kind of was wondering, you know, how do people describe that are close to you sort of observed you or maybe your parents even, how do they describe you, your, your personality and how has that historically sort of made your work kind of unique, you know, like, like at different parts of your life, you know, what, what was it about the way you approached work that was kind of reflective in that personality? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of personality based explanations of things, whether they're yeah. research. It's true that I'm willing, I, I would say I'm not risk averse. Mm. And I think to be a successful scientist, you do need to, you know, if you want to be very successful, of course, you can have a very respectable career in science yeah. without taking a lot of risk because there's right. a lot of work to be done mm. and it's valuable work. It's, it's perfectly legitimate, but mm. You know, if you want to have a big impact, you have to take risks and, and take it, take, take the risk that the thing, you know, it's a relatively off the wall idea and it's not going to work out. So right, right, I guess you right. could say that's part of my personality. I've never been risk averse. If I saw something that looked fun and exciting and interesting, yeah. I was able, or maybe just fun and exciting. Hold on yeah, one yeah, second. Yeah. Yeah. 
if I yeah. saw something that looked exciting and I, I found it exciting, you know, I could imagine myself doing that. Yeah. Some things I don't, don't, you know, I don't imagine myself doing. So I have things that I don't particularly aspire to, you know, I don't particularly want to climb Mount Everest. Right. But, right. Uh, right. And, I, and I don't want to do anything that has anything to do with being underwater for a long time. But yeah. when I visited Israel and I thought Israel was very exciting and I connected with it. I have a generation of my family that moved to Israel in the 1930s. Mm. And I could see myself participating in that kind of project, you know, the Israeli mm. project, building the oh, society. Wow. And what about that? a good friend what, of mine from mine. Wait, what Go about ahead. that fits your personality? What about that kind of project? What is it you're talking about? Well, it's, you know, I, instead of kind of going to graduate school after college, I moved to Israel. Mm, oh, and, yeah. And uh, you know, people were kind of shocked. I, I wasn't particularly, I definitely didn't have a religious upbringing. You know, I wasn't a committed Zionist, but then I visited Israel as a junior in college. As it happens, a good friend of mine from high school, Mike Drescher, was there. And we enjoyed our time in Israel. And we said, oh, you kind of made a pact. We said, after we get out of college, we're going to come back. Yeah. And then we did. And I had actually, I've been invited to go to Princeton by Orly Aschenfelder, who was the outside honors examiner at Oberlin, where I did an mm -hmm. honors thesis. Mm -hmm. I knew Orly and, you know, I, he, I'm very lucky. He liked me and he wrote me a letter and said I should come to Princeton and do my PhD. But initially I didn't do that. I went to Israel for three years because I yeah, thought that yeah. would be something interesting to do. How old was that? I'm sorry. Well, it was. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then Mike and I decided to join the army. We sort of we knew some people in the army. In particular, we wanted to be paratroopers. Yeah, is that what you were? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So I could sort of, you know, I could imagine myself doing that. And then, you know, I always have this feeling when I see something like that. You know, the thing that would keep me awake at night is not doing something. Oh. Feeling like, well, I had the chance and I let it go. Hmm. Hmm. So you sort of would always, you're sort of a personality that kind of live life to its fullest type of personality. I guess you could say that. Yeah. I mean, the work that you did, uh, and I'm going to kind of ask a little bit about this. It, it does seem like uh, real big jumps of uh, doing things really differently. I mean, it, the, well, I wasn't, I don't know. I wouldn't push that too far. I was in a, a place and a time where there were people doing the kind yeah. of things that I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Orly talked very nicely about that. Princeton in the 80s when I was a grad. So eventually I did do my PhD. Yeah. Because when I got out of the army, you know, I had to decide what to do next. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with Orly in the spring of 85. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, remember me, I was the college senior you said should come to Princeton. Could I come to Princeton? Yeah. And he said, sure, come in the fall. And so that was that. And, wow. um, but then there was all this great stuff going on at Princeton. Yeah. You know, Dave Card was a young faculty member there. And I, uh, Bob Lalonde had finished his thesis a few years earlier. Bob had right. done this great work showing uh, that, it, you know, trying to estimate the effects of training programs and showing that you would probably need a randomized trial to get it right. Orly and David were doing great work on that. They had two papers in particular, the Ashenfelder 78, Ashenfelder and Card 85. Mm -hmm. Card's 88 paper was Sullivan. So I was just gobbling all that stuff up. I, I can't exactly describe why, but I just loved that stuff. And I had this feeling like, you know, I would like to write papers like these. Yeah, yeah. And I, when, I, when I meet young people who want to go to graduate school, I kind of try to elicit that from them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, tell me the papers you wish you had written. Right. Right. I'd have been happy to be the author of, you know, Bob Lalonde's thesis. Yeah, yeah. Or any of the Ashenfelder card training papers. Mm. You know, I mm. really saw myself doing that. I was able to imagine myself doing that. Once I, initially, I, you know, you get to graduate school, you're clueless. So I had no idea. But then I took Orly's labor class. I actually took it twice. Mm. And, um, you know, it was full of interesting material to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not not that it was just a good read, but I could 
see myself doing it for a living. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been like in my brain, uh, ref, like trying to, I'm always trying to kind of find the right language to talk about causal inference. Cause there's, you know, there's like this Uta Pearl stuff and then there's like Heckman's tradition. And it's like, I always kind of think I come from this literature background and you would always talk about schools of thought. And yeah. so I've been thinking this story and I kind of wanted to just run it by you that Princeton uh, industrial relations group was this kind of uh, the beginning of uh, design-based causal inference. And there was something about this uh, in the air that began to focus on these physical assignment of treatments mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe letting the, 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 like the mathematical model from some sort of theory of the, some sort of theory of the, of the household or something like that, do all the heavy lifting of identification. Right. There seemed to be there was a shift to that. And Orly and yeah. David were big in that. Yeah. And da David's Nobel speech talk. That's where I got it from. It was the speech he gave uh, at Michigan in 2014. That's just mm -hmm. like kind of haunted me of, uh, of you guys were in this tradition of Fisher and it was like, and I, maybe I got this from card, but it's like Fisher randomized experiment assigns the treatment. Ruben propensity score assigns the treatment. Yeah. And then you, the instrument assigns the treatment. You and you and and Hito. And yeah, that, I think you're right onto something there, Scott. So and Steve and I um talk about this some in an essay we wrote on the way econometrics is taught. Econometrics, I think, in the 70s and 80s, you know and probably I guess in the 60s as well, though the empirical work was much more naive to today's eye in the 60s. Right. right. But, you know, microeconometrics was starting to be a big deal in the 70s, partly as computing power was improving. Yeah. And, um, you know, the focus on econometrics was kind of modeling the process for outcomes. Right. As opposed to the treatment. You know, where does the variation come from? Which, if you come into the room saying, where does the variation come from? That that's one giant step closer to sort of an experimental perspective. Right. But what I really want to do is a randomized trial. Yeah. And now I need to find a way to do that. At the same time, you know, it wasn't cleanly that because there was a lot of focus, and this was also true in the section, and it's true in Orly and David's work. There was a lot of focus on panel data. Mm. And panel data is it more about outcomes than treatment. You know, that there's an unobserved individual effect, which is additive in the model for outcomes. Right. But then some of Orly and David's work also talks about, you know, well, is that unobserved individual effect the only thing that's determining treatment? So they're kind of, they're making that bridge. Yeah. What does a fixed effects model of the world say about treatment assignment? And that turned out to be inadequate. Right. And in particular, you know, Orly had the insight that the trainees earnings dip Heckman christened this Aschenfelder's dip. Yeah. And, um, well, fixed effects aren't going to fix that. Right. Um, so that was brewing as a sort of an approach to the world. I, I was also heavily influenced when I got to Harvard. I started to read a lot about the propensity score. Yeah. And I met Ruben, you know, who had an office in the building across the path, really, from mine. Yeah. And we started to communicate. Initially, Don was not very interested in what I was doing, so I was trying to sell him on it. Uh huh. And, you mean he wasn't uh, interested in the instrumental variable? He he sort of. It wasn't clear to him that it it was relevant for what he was interested in, and I was trying to convince him that not only was it relevant, it was core. Uh -huh. And um, you know, we started by core. I was only at Harvard for two years. Right, I saw that. I went from 89 and, and then Hito came in 90. So we only overlapped for one year, but we came friends very quickly and mm. started talking a lot together. We happened to be neighbors. We spent time together doing our laundry and mm. hanging out in Litauer, the building there where the econ department is, where on any given day, there aren't very many faculty members, but Hito and I would be there. And also Gary Chamberlain, who was yeah. very, you know, a mentor to us. Mm. And and uh, anyway, I, I tried to convince Don that the IV idea was worthwhile. You know, it was sort of, I had to sell him on it. And I did that primarily through my draft lottery example, mm. which he found compelling. And Hito and I, in the meantime, we were grappling with the issue of what can you learn from instrumental variables in the Rubin world? 
Mm. And I had actually not sort of embraced the Rubin world at Princeton. I didn't really know about it. It was Jamie Robbins, who's a biostatistician at Harvard. You mean when you say the Rubin world, you potential mean outcomes, potential outcomes, one outcomes. Y zero, wow. with no restrictions, no regression in between you and the outcomes. Right. And you know, that the goal is an average causal effect. Mm. And in terms of those unrestricted potential, you know, Heckman would say, oh, well, that's all over econometrics, that's in Roy and so on. And that, that might be true, but it wasn't the predominant paradigm. Right. And the, you know, the focus in econometrics was more on modeling that outcome process. Right. And right. then the assignment is some latent index, but that's really not the focus. Right. And, and uh, Jamie pushed me to start reading what Don's, Don's work, you know, which by then was quite voluminous. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking more about that. And Hito and I had also kind of gravitated to that ourselves. And we were aware that there was kind of no good theorem on what instrumental variables does uh -huh. in that world. And we had a partial kind of resolution, which is what we came later to call the Bloom scenario, named after Howard Bloom, mm. who had first proved that if you have a randomized trial and you have partial compliance, so that sounds like IV where the randomization is the instrument, and if the compliance is only on one side, the non-compliance is only on the treated side, then an IV-like formula gives you the effective treatment on the treated. So Hito and I had that written up in the, in the late 1990 or early 91, but we didn't really have the full lay theorem until later that year. Mm. Mm. What was it like working together? What were, what, so walk me through y'all's process. It was like back and forth. Well, we had a lot of fun together. I mean, we would talk about mostly about applications. I think that's why it was so fruitful. We weren't sort of into proving theorems because it's satisfying to prove theorems. Don't get me wrong, it is satisfying to prove theorems. I kind of appreciate, you know, the the satisfaction of showing something. Right. You know, that's potentially useful. But even if it's not useful, you've shown something that somebody didn't know before. Right. But you know, and I were very much interested in, say, the draft lottery example or the, the, the paper with Alan Kruger on quarter birth. I had started that in grad school where Alan came as an assistant professor. You had started that in grad school? That was yeah. one of your, that was, was that a It wasn't in my thesis, but Alan, Alan and I met when he came to Princeton. Uh huh. He came to Princeton my last year, I think he was an assistant professor at Princeton. Uh huh. Okay. I think he came in 88. And so Alan also he he blended into that Princeton vibe of cool causal inference. Yeah, in most yeah. In, with, with labor economics applications. Of course, yeah. Alan did many things. He was interested in other things. He was always more eclectic than me. Really? You know, like his paper on the effects of computer yeah. use on wages. I had never written that paper. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. You know, I don't. It's kind of flimsily causal. Right. But, it's still a very useful paper and it's widely cited and I teach it and everything, you know, uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so Alan was always willing to go and do that sort of thing as well. Yeah. But, you know, Alan and I worked together on instrumental variables problems. We ended up writing quite a few papers. Yeah. And the first one was the quarter birth paper, which actually is two papers. There's one in JASA on age at entry and there's the QGE paper that everybody mm -hmm. knows. Yeah. Anyone. So I came to Harvard with those kind of applications in mind, and Hito and I would just discuss them. We also would get together and socially a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, we'd go out and do hikes and things together with our, our little ones at the time. Uh -huh. And um, the thing that was it, uh, great about Hito is, you know, it's really what you look for in a co-author. You know, he wouldn't just chat. Yeah. Talk is cheap, you know, in our world. Right, right. So we would discuss something and then he would write it up and produce notes. And he'd say, I think this is what, you know, what we know about this. Mm. He'd have mm. some notation for it and he'd have some, some results. Mm. Or he'd explain why he didn't have a result. Mm. So he would go back and come up with notes and it would be very concrete. So I could kind of see papers emerging from it. Mm. So that was great. So this yeah. conversation, y'all were having these conversations. I mean, so when did you start to articulate something like the local average treatment effect and the average? 1991, I think. 
Yeah, so it was coming out of these. It's in my, I think the written version of my Nobel. So my Nobel lecture is, was taped for on Zoom. Or not, yeah. on, not, not on Zoom, actually. It was taped in a recording studio. Yeah. But uh, there's a written version that's more expansive on the intellectual history. It's an NBR working paper. Uh huh. And it has some of the dates and stuff. But we had the basically the late theorem in November of 91, as I recall. Can I show you this? I want to show you sure. uh, uh, this this thing I thought was interesting. Um, so this is from the um, this is from the the scientific release, the bigger article that the Nobel mm -hmm. committee. Yeah, this is very nicely written. Oh, it's wonderful! It's just yeah. incredible. This is one of the things I wish I had written was the the description of all the work. So it yeah. says uh, in the late '80s, researchers began to investigate under what conditions a treatment effect can be estimated. Yeah. When effects are heterogeneous, I'm reading it for the sake of the podcast. Oh, okay. And compl compliance is incomplete. The early contributors to this literature, including Gary Chamberlain, James Robbins, Jim Heckman, and Charles Mansky, focusing either on specifying conditions under which the average treatment effect can be estimated or on bounding. This contribution showed that the causal effect for those who took part in the intervention could only be estimated under special circumstances and in practical applications, the bounds were too big. And so, um, so I, I was wondering, um, it, it's not really clear, it's hard to hear these stories in the past because you can't really imagine what was going on at the time. You just kind of have these like, all this kind of survivor bias where <laughs> all I know is, uh, all I know is your work and that's mm -hmm. the work I remember. And so I was just kind of wondering what was the context at the time of like that broader community and the, the debates that everybody was having? And um, what did they think about the work that you and Inman's were doing? Well, that's two distinct questions. So let me talk a little bit about the context because there were some key contributions there. Uh, Gary Chamberlain had a couple papers that were actually sort of negative results. So he had a results showing that you're never going to get the average treatment effect effectively. I mean, his, his papers are very technical, but this is an implication. Oh. If the probability of selection isn't driven into the tails, in other words, it's not, it has to be driven to zero and one. Mm. And I think for the purposes of this kind of discussion, there's not really a big distinction between the effect of treatment on the treated and the effect of the average treatment effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, and that was why the Bloom theorem worked, because actually you, you had a group where the probability of treatment was zero, mm. which is what happens in, in a latent index model when the covariates have infinite support, then with some, you know, vanishingly small probability, but not, never, the probability of treatment is driven by a covariate that has infinite support into the tails. And Heckman had a result in a 1990 paper that I think was actually in the papers and proceedings, a very brief paper, which had a version of that idea applied to treatment effects. Mm -hmm. Gary's result was more general uh, about sort of sample selection problems of all kinds. And Heckman's result was uh, later kind of christened as identification at infinity, or, or maybe Chamberlain came up with that. But it was sort of seen as a negative result because, yeah. you know, it's not going to happen, you know, it's sort of a, a version of a technical thing that kind of never happens, but it's true that a, a normally distributed random variable can be plus or minus infinity. Right. So what does that really mean for empirical work? You shouldn't count on it. Right. And, um, and the, you know, and also thinking on these problems was heavily influenced by kind of the latent index work for workhorse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, proved to be quite limiting because the latent index model is basically telling you that you you need a covariate that has infinite support, you know, yeah. because the latent index model with continuously distributed errors right. isn't going to produce that Bloom scenario. Right. And you right. could replicate this on your computer. You know, you, if you try to run the first stage for the Bloom problem with Probit, you'll get an error. It won't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, because probit probabilities can never be zero or one. Probit or logit. Right. And sometimes I have my students do this. Yeah. You know, so you need to get out of that somehow. So that's one thing that Hito and I were willing to do. We weren't wedded to the latent index paradigm, even though we wanted to understand it. 
Right. So there were these negative results, and Heckman had the paper with Rob, you know, which was a very comprehensive review of what was known about treatment effects at the time. I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah. And I was studying that, you know, like the Bible. Mm. And, you know, I had focused on the section there on IV, which really was not, you know, it was mostly discouraging. This kind of like you need constant effects to learn anything. Right. So we, we saw that as a, as a big methodological challenge. Yeah. And we had applications that sort of left us feeling like, well, it can't be that IV is worthless. If you think about, you know, the draft lottery, it can't be that you only get something out of it when their effects are constant. Right. There's some intuitive sense in which there are men who are conscripted. They wouldn't have served if they hadn't been conscripted. We must be learning something about these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that was the context, Scott. What, what was the other question? Oh, uh, what was the reaction to what we were about. doing? Yeah. Was the it, reaction was mixed. You know, I would say Gary Chamberlain, you know, to our great good fortune, was very excited about what we were doing mm. and gave us extremely important feedback along the way. And actually, Hito and I had a version of the late theorem that kind of relied on a latent index setup. Yeah. And Gary said, you know, you don't really need that. You can just define potential assignments. And that was a wonderful insight, which simplified the presentation of the theorem, and I think also made it much more appealing outside of economics to people like Rubin. Right. That we didn't have this, the superstructure of latent index, which was really a very economic model that didn't mm -hmm. seem widely applicable. Mm. Um, and some people were critical of it, I think, because, so Gary was super supportive and that was important. I think some econometricians were critical of it. Well, I know that they were critical of it, but I think the reason they were critical of it is that there was this idea that the goal of econometric science was to uncover something called structure. Mm. And structure was like how the economy works. Right. It's really causal relationships. Yeah. And that, you know, a really, uh, a really good econometrician or economic scientist, we might say, would be able to use data to reveal structure. Yeah. And we're saying, well, not really. There's no such thing as structure. Every experiment generates its own causal effect. So even in well identified models from the point of view of, say, you know, traditional identification, where the likelihood is not flat, okay, mm -hmm. you still get something that's idiosyncratic. And the same structure will not be manifest in the data the same way when you change the experiment, when you change the exclusion restrictions. Mm. And you could see this tension between what we were doing and what econometricians had done in, in Goldberger's textbook. I don't know if you've taken a look at that ever. No, I've just seen so some articles. Goldberger has a, a kind of a, um, I forget what year it was published, but I think it's just called Econometrics. Mm. He had a few books, but this is the more recent one. And he has this sort of very dismissive discussion of, of the idea of causality. Hmm. He doesn't like causality. You know, he's one of the great econometricians that ever, the greatest econometricians ever lived. He was Gary Chamberlain's mentor in, in many ways at Wisconsin, where Gary spent time. And we all have a lot to learn from Art Goldberger, but he, he did sort of not want to be bothered with ideas of causality. He said, well, if causality means structure, then that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. So it's worth going and looking that up, actually. Yeah. It's quite striking in, in the context of today, if you're interested in the history of thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll do and um, so I think there were a lot of people that felt that, you know, we were sort of undermining that, that, that agenda. Yeah, yeah. So it was, there was some pushback, that's to say yeah. the least, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I don't want to skip over uh, Alan Kruger. I have here a question about him. Um, so, sure. so what, what did you, th what worked about that relationship for both of y'all? How is it different than your, how is it different in, and how is it similar to your work with, with uh, Embens in terms of just the productivity of it? Well, Alan and I did applied work together. Right. Uh, we also, you know, hit it off fairly soon when he came to Princeton Orly brought him. I don't think he was going to be 
giving a fly out on the junior market and then Orly's wife sat next to him on a plane. I heard that. Yeah, great story. And Jenna Ashenfutter knew enough about our world to know that Alan was worth talking to. Yeah. And Orly followed up and then, and, and then Alan came to Harvard. I mean, came to Princeton. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, Alan and I were friends and uh, we enjoyed working together, but we had a little bit of a competitive edge in our relationship because Alan was the Harvard guy and I was the Princeton guy. Oh. You know, and I think at Princeton at that time, we thought, you know, those Harvard guys are not very rigorous. Oh. And, you know, they don't really know much econometrics the way we do. Uh huh. Um, but Alan, of course, was a gifted applied econometrician mm. and a uh, very systematic thinker. Mm. And so we, we meshed very well. He had lots of ideas about how to look at empirical relationships. He was also a very good writer. Mm. And I learned a lot about writing papers from working with Alan. Yeah. Which what did he think about that? Today, what did he emphasize, you know. What did he think about the work you were doing with Ruben and Emmons? I'm sure, I mean, I'm just curious. Well, Alan was very interested in it. Uh -huh. And, you know, he was, I mean, we, we, Alan and I ended up working with Hito on on the many weak instruments problem yeah right yeah and um so he was very in, yeah i mean you well, he was excited you know we were excited by the quarter of birth discovery that that was an instrument for schooling which you know for labor economists i'm sure you'll appreciate that's like the holy grail yeah yeah you know yeah. that's our big causal question do people who are more educated earn more right Right. Because right. of their schooling, or is it just that the people who are going to be doing well in the economy anyway get more schooling because right. they come from better family backgrounds or more right. well-off families? Yeah. And Alan and I felt like we had a, a solution to that problem. And uh, we were super excited about that. It was, it was a very exciting time. Yeah. We had sort of stumbled on it. How'd you find that? You didn't just mm -hmm. reason it? You didn't just reason it out from just kind of reading the compulsory schooling stuff? No, no, it was a byproduct of work that we were doing on World War II veterans. Oh, really? So Al Alan came to Princeton, you know, my thesis was kicking around in a working paper, I think. Mm -hmm. Already, I had some results by the time Alan came. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Alan observed at some point that everybody thinks that World War II veterans benefited from their service. Uh -huh. And it's true that if you take the relevant cohorts of men born in the 1920s, you know, men who served in World War II earn more than men who don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could explain that, that my Vietnam thing is negative, but maybe the World War II guys benefited because, you know, the GI Bill is such a big deal and so on. So there's, you know, it could be that it's just a different thing. Yeah. Later, I, I learned that that's probably not very likely that there was a substantial GI Bill in Vietnam, in the Vietnam cohort as well. But anyway, and then, of course, there's a strong case for believing World War II effects are contaminated by selection bias. Uh -huh. The World War II veterans, for example, live longer than non-veterans the same age. That's mm -hmm. a classic example of selection bias, because mm -hmm. the process that determines who's a veteran at that time is basically screening out people with health problems. Oh, right, right. And very right. low test scores. Of course. So, um, Alan and I were looking for an instrument for World War II veteran status. Yeah. Around 1991. Right. And we started, so we did approach the problem like I described to you. We were reading the, the selective service publications, the selective service system that's responsible for conscription. Mm -hmm. And we were re reading all their old reports and everything. And we discovered that there was a kind of a, a, a chronological birthday based conscription thing. So it wasn't the lottery, but it was in order of your day of birth. Mm. And there was a kind of a first stage for that. It wasn't great, but it wasn't nothing. But yeah. we started to look at what else is correlated with your quarter of birth. And we saw that there were these striking up and down schooling effects mm -hmm. that didn't seem to have anything to do with, you know, veteran status. Yeah. It was just a very different pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and, the same graph that goes in the paper the, with the dots? Yeah, we had some version of that. Yeah. And we, we just puzzled on that for a while. And eventually oh. we it occurred to us that this this whole compulsory schooling thing and you know we 
collected a lot of evidence in support of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the interesting thing is the that World War II paper was published three years after the the AK ninety one paper. Mm -hmm. So we had problems publishing the World War II paper, mm. but maybe we should have because by then we had shown that it wasn't a very good instrument for veteran status because it was correlated with schooling. Right. Birth. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. But anyway, that was a lot of fun. Those were joyful times, you know, working with Alan. His loss is a great tragedy. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember those days quite vividly. Mm -hmm. And we felt like we were onto something. You know, not only was that an important application, but we, we did have sort of an MO. We had a way of approaching empirical problems. Mm. And then we had a way of doing things with two stagely squares, which maybe, you know, some of that didn't turn out to be a great idea. Lots and lots of instruments didn't turn out to be a great idea. So John Bound and, and uh, uh, Bound yeah. Jagger Baker showed yeah. that in 95, that was kicking around in 93. Mm -hmm. Alan and I lost a lot of sleep about that, the weak instruments problem, but then that was very fruitful as well. Yeah, yeah. What, can you elaborate on that? that? That's the kind of thing I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of us sort of worry about a little bit is, um, anything that comes out well some people do you know i know that i have something that might come after me and criticize and and i might not be have well maybe well, it's, not, it's not fun when somebody takes apart your work yeah and finds a problem with it yeah yeah i you know the first time that happened to me was when i met paul becker that's becker b-e-k-k-e-r yeah, yeah in a bar, a pub, I guess you'd call it, in Amsterdam. It was like my first talk in Europe since I had been on the RES tour. Uh -huh. And uh, Geert Ritter had invited me to Amsterdam. And Becker came up to me in this, after seminar, I had given, I think, one of the, the versions of the late paper. And he said, you know, your draft lottery thing, that AER paper, that's all fucked up. And I said, well, who are you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and he goes on to tell me that I'm using too many instruments and the thing is badly biased and et cetera, et cetera. And I was kind of dismissive at the time, uh -huh. but of course he turned out to be right. And he has a very important paper explaining all this, which is published before BJB uh -huh. 94. But Becker's paper is, and Becker's paper is motivated by my draft lottery paper, but it's not really an empirical paper, and it's you know not something that's easy to read for people who aren't schooled in the relevant theory. But he turned out to be absolutely right in general, though my draft lottery paper was a two-sample problem, uh -huh. so it doesn't have the many weak bias. Mm -hmm. But I just got lucky there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could have, and. and you know, today I would say, well, also the just identified estimates are the same and they're not biased or not right. much. Right. But, um, you know, so that's very stressful for a scholar when somebody comes along and says your work is all fucked up. Right. And you've made a mistake or you've failed to notice something. Yeah. Yeah. When I, you know, now I've, I have the wisdom of experience and I could say, well, in many ways, that's the best thing that can happen to you because it means that somebody took your work seriously enough yeah. that yeah. you were worthy of investigation. You know, most papers are not worthy of right. investigating. It's sort of clear that we shouldn't take the empirical results too seriously mm -hmm. because the analysis isn't convincing or the person doing it has not taken the trouble to yeah. report them in a, in a credible way. Right, right. And so when Becker or somebody like that comes along, yeah, it's it's stressful for the for the receiver, but it is ultimately a compliment. You know, looking back on the the many week thing, that was tough. Alan and I were losing sleep over that. Alan and had suggested to John Bound, who had been his classmate at Harvard, that John do this thing where he just draw the instruments randomly and see what you get if you estimate our models as if, you know, they were real. Well, you do get something that looks a lot like what we got when the models are the 180 instrument model. Right, right. Well, that was terrifying. You know, it meant it meant that we had, you know, we were sort of felt like, oh, my God, we had fooled ourselves and we had fooled the world with this yeah. paper that got a lot of attention. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I, Jacob Mincer was super excited about our paper. Uh, Gary Becker was super excited about our paper. And that, you know, oh man! You know, the big I, substantive finding was that OLS and two stage two squares. Right, so, right. Oh, I bet they were. I bet they were. So, but then Alan and I, and I was back in Israel at the time. So that was inhibiting sort of interacting on the problem. As it happens that summer, I was on reserve duty and I was doubly miserable because there was limited attention I could give to the problem being isolated out in this desert outpost. The uh, upshot of it is we started working on it. We came up with the two sample, um, split sample IV and then we started working with Hedo and we came up with lots of solutions to the many week problem. Right, right, and I remember right. a very gratifying summer institute at the NBR where a lot of that work was presented. And mm -hmm. I felt very good about that. I thought, you know, it's, it's real science that we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of reframing of it. That's, that's, uh, that's a, that's a useful skill uh, in life in general of, of kind of, uh, getting a hold of those things, those things that hijack your uh, interpretation of these events that are happening. It is scary to, to it may, it's, it's easy to go into stories that where you question who you are or you, you feel bad about yourself. Um, well, you have to remember, of course, everybody makes mistakes and yeah. scientists and researchers, you know, there's so much detail and so much work involved in any given project that you've probably made some mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, only have a couple of minutes sure. to keep you. So um, I wanted to talk about Blueprint Labs because it seems like that's uh, probably something you're really excited about. Um, yeah. what, what Can you tell us a little bit about that? Where, what well, it, Blueprint where... Labs was, was born when Parag Pathak was hired at MIT, you know, mm -hmm. over a decade ago. Parag uh, did his thesis on market design. Mm -hmm. which is not something I had given any thought to until I started reading his work on mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, it was another great collaboration, like my collaboration with Hito and with Alan and with Victor Levy in Israel, that you know, we hit it off right away. We had a lot of overlapping interests, but we had somewhat different skills. Yeah. And we complemented each other. And yeah. Rog, uh, kind of opened my eyes to the world of school assignment. You know, by now I'm heavily in the design-based mode of thinking. And so I start to see through Parag's work that there's all kinds of experiments for schools going on and somebody needs to figure out how to use that. Mm. And so Parag and I started to collaborate. We also worked uh, often with Attila Abdul Kadiroglu, who had done a lot of good work on market design. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that proved to be very exciting, very fruitful. It had super challenging methodological problems. Mm -hmm. You know, the market design thing is kind of complicated and messy. There's randomness in there, but how do you get it out, you know, in an elegant way? Yeah. You'll use all of it. So there were, that turned out to be the problem of the propensity score uh -huh. for centralized assignment, which we solved in a 2017 paper with Attila. Yeah. And, um, then there's an RD element in some cases, which we first encountered in our work on exam schools, uh -huh. and eventually kind of melded those two in a paper that was just published last year. Uh -huh. So that, that just provided an endless stream of super important applications that people care about, like going to exam schools or charter schools. Yeah. Plus the, you know, the challenge of some, some interesting methodological problems. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's work that I love and, you know, I, it's very much the fruits of this collaboration with Parag. I don't think I would have come to it myself. Yeah. Why, why'd you feel the need to create a lab though? It's something so, something so. Well, the lab it started as what we called the school effectiveness and inequality initiative. So, that kind of work requires that you get access to data on school matches mm -hmm. and their t kids test scores so you need some infrastructure for that you have to execute data agreements right uh so that's very time consuming you need people who kind of do nothing but that and you also the data sets themselves are very large very messy they're not designed for research mm. you need research assistants who work on those things full time i see 
And so we need an infrastructure for that. So, you know, then you need to raise money. So we need help raising money, doing grant proposals. It becomes something like a life sciences lab. Right. Know, that that there, there's a lot of staff time needed. Yeah. It's not, it's not you and a pencil and paper in a coffee shop anymore. Right. Or right. even it's not you and your laptop anymore. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. too much infrastructure. Some of the data analysis has to be done in a secure computing environment. You know, like we have this randomized trial on financial aid that we did with the Buffett Foundation that's worked joint with David Otter and our former student, Mandy Palace. So that work has to actually physically be done in this secure room. So somebody has to build this room and equip it you know, and then there's a lot of data agreements. So that project has data agreements with every public university and college in Nebraska, a separate mm. data agreement for each one of those. So that's a lot of, a lot of staff time. Yeah, 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 I bet, I bet. So that's yeah. sort of the, my, the world of my empirical work today is very much a team sport. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. So that's a change in your lifetime because that, that kind of it thing is. wasn't really necessary or uh, right. The draft lottery I did myself. Alan and I worked with census data. We were able to do that ourselves, which I don't, we, we, the, the main research assistant on the quarter birth projects was Alan's wife, Lisa. Uh -huh. she, collected the, she collected the compulsory attendance data. So why are all these labs growing then? Why do you think this is happening? Is it the... Well, I, I think there's a lot of empirical work today that has those considerations. There's a yeah. data agreements and there are large administrative data sets there's privacy issues right and you know the files are large and it's sort of also it's ongoing it's not like there's one data set it's constantly being refreshed right 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 so a lot of applied micro is in that domain if you're running a randomized trial there's a lot of management there mm, mm. Huh. so you know i i like this world but it it's you know it's easy for me to say because I, I work in a successful lab. Right. I think young scholars sometimes are intimidated and, and, and don't quite know how to get started. Yeah, yeah. My suggestion would be to hook up with a more senior scholar and learn how it's done and then either keep that relationship going or spin something off. So we have a lot of former students who, you know, work successfully both with us and separately, like yeah. Peter Hall and uh, Mandy is an example. I mentioned uh, Chris Walters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer. This has okay, been so great nice. chatting with you, Scott. Uh, thanks so much for giving me your time. Sure. My pleasure.